Um, so shout out to Jasmine <laughs> for that. And then <laughs> Lynn, if you want to just briefly introduce yourself and then um, we'll go ahead and get started. Sure. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, so glad that you've joined us tonight. My name's Lynn Wells. I'm a native of Greensboro. Um, I do some freelance work for Our State Magazine. I also own my own personal chef service and do a few other little things like this, cooking demos now on Zoom, thanks to, thanks to COVID. So welcome, glad you're here. All right, thank you. So, yep, I think we're, go ahead, we're good to go ahead and get started. All right, well, I'm super excited tonight about this recipe. Um, you know, you think I was gonna do something like holiday-ish, um, and it, it still can be, but what I love about it is, is it's super colorful, it is great with textures, um, it's delicious and kind of special. One of my clients that I cooked for actually sent me the recipe um, and it's super healthy. If you are um, like you want something with a lot of volume and flavor, this is the perfect dish. It can be a side dish and it can also be a main course if you're vegetarian or vegan. Um, I do use honey so it's not you know, strictly vegan, but this is a super recipe for vegetarians. And when you put this on the table, if you cook it during the holidays, if you put this on the table with all the other traditional dishes, everybody is going to make a comment. Ooh and ah, it's beautiful. So I'm going to get started. Um, butternut, it's really, you know, two main ingredients, the butternut squash um, and black lentils. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each um, ingredient. But what I wanted to do is um, show you how to safely and um, real, mainly safely cut a butternut squash. This is, um, has a much um, tougher and thicker skin to it than say a yellow summer squash or a zucchini. Um, and you really wanna use a sharp knife. So I'm gonna do a couple things. I'm gonna show you how to cut this. Um, these are plentiful this time of year. They're also in grocery stores um, year round, but this is a great time to get them. So butternut squash, it's kind of got, you know, long and then has this little bulb at the, at the bottom. This is a kind of a medium size, um, but I'm gonna show you the knives not to use. Um, you, would, you don't wanna use a paring knife um, because really you, you need a stronger knife to really get behind it. And you also don't wanna use a serrated bread knife because it's, it's gonna be, have a lot more give. Safe, the safest bet is going to use a really sturdy, sharp um, French knife. This is a 10 inch or excuse me, eight inch, um, just a chef knife. You can get in um, any grocery store. Make sure you keep your knives sharp. That's a, set, that's a whole separate class. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the ends off like so. And I'm just going to put these, put these aside. And then just to make it a little bit more manageable, uh, I'm gonna cut this in half and you always wanna make sure you keep your you know, hands out of the way. Now, there's a couple of options here. You could peel this either towards you or away from you. But as you can see, and these peelers are pretty, you know, I mean, they're pretty, pretty sturdy and sharp. Um, so this is an option. But one, I'm going to show you just a different, um, a different way to do it. And this is the way um, that I use, usually do them. You know, it's personal preference. But um, I take my knife and I keep, the, keep this ground so it's pretty solid. And I'm just going to keep my, you know, fingers tucked in. And I'm just going to um, move this around and cut the peel off or the skin off like so. And just move it around. It's probably just as quick either way. This is also how I cut a pineapple. Um, it's how I cut apples and oranges. Matter of fact, I'm going to cut an um, orange here in a minute because I think visually you'll get a better angle watching me cut, cut this. But you can see as I, as I trim this up that it's, you know, it's pretty tough. Now, this, um, this part, the elongated part, doesn't have seeds, but this one does. Isn't that beautiful color? Every time I cut a butternut squash or an acorn squash or beets, I, just, I mean, I just, I, call me a food nerd, but I love the colors. And I, for just a second, I'm like, 
I want to paint a room this color. <laughs> so I'm going to just, I'm going to cut this in half. Well, I'm actually going to cut it in thirds because that's how I'm going to show you how I cut it. But I just want you to see that the, um, you know, the seeds are not all that hard to get out and remove. But I'm going to show you how to, how I cut this, this part. But for the recipe, I'm just going to show you from top down. So I'm going to, I'm going to go into thirds. One, two, so three pieces. One, and then two. And again, this is, you know, there's no right or wrong. This is just um, how I have found um, that it's easiest and how I get the most uniform um, pieces when I'm cutting. Now, I'm going to stop and just say that if you were making, um, let's say what you were doing roasted butternut squash soup, um, what I would do is not, I would just kind of cut it like this, and you could even leave the skin on and then turn it upside down, um, put it on the baking sheet, turn the you know oven on, put it in a preheated oven, and cook it because if you're not, if it's not going to be cut in a cube or any kind of shape, then when it's done, you can just scoop this out with a spoon and you can scoop the meat out and have the that the, that part of the squash. But since this is in cubes and we're going to roast it and we want it to hold its form, I'm going to just show you um, kind of how I how I do this. Also, you can use you know think of this as a baked potato. You know you could do you know that's kind of like a big um, butternut squash french fry. So I'm just cutting it into strips and then you want about a half an inch to an inch cube like so. And I'm going to just set these on a um, baking sheet lined with parchment paper. And this is just moves pr um, really you know very easily. Um, we've got our oven preheating to 400. Um, you, usually when I'm roasting vegetables, especially something this dense, 400 is a great um, temperature because it's hot enough for you to get some caramelization. Um, and I've got some cooked pieces here in case you don't know what caramelization is. So this is butternut squash that's been cooked and you can see it's got a really rich color. And this is, um, you know, th this is the side that was down on the baking sheet and um, for 20, 25 minutes at 400 degrees. So that's your caramelization. It gets super sweet that really, um, the temperature ca really causes the natural sugars to come out. And the other thing, you don't wanna cram the butternut squash really close together on the baking sheet because then it'll steam. Um, you know, think about it as body heat when we're close together, we, you know, we, we really feel the heat um, and we, we get hot. You want it to enable to caramelize, you want it to be able to be spaced, just have a little bit of space in between. So just for time purposes, I'm gonna go ahead and cut just this part and we'll get this on the cookie sheet. Like so, it doesn't have to be, you know, exactly and uniform and all that, but just so you've got some nice bite-sized pieces. Um, you know, this is, and now keep in mind, even though I didn't peel this, I'm gonna go ahead and, you know, again, this is, you can either scoop this part out with a spoon to get the seeds out, or another little trick that I do is you can just cut those strips and cut it around the seeds and keep turning your squash. And then boom, you've got, you know, you've got your strips here and you might have one or two little stragglers there and just scoop them out. And then you've got that part of the butternut squash cut. So I'm gonna put this on the cookie sheet or the baking sheet. And you know, um, you don't have to line it with parts, but you could also line it with um, spray some cooking um, spray. And then you're just gonna, you know, once you get this all spread out, you can either do this in a bowl um, so that they get evenly distributed, or you can drizzle olive oil, of course, wash your hands. You know, hands are your best cool, uh, tool in the kitchen. So we've got those spread out. Got my hands real quick. And then we'll just, you know, do a little salt. And you probably see on some of these food shows, the chefs holding their salt real high. Um, that's not to look fancy or show off or anything. It's just that it, it helps you see, you know, where 
you're hitting the, the item with the salt. So, you know, you'll see them um, sprinkling the salt up a little high. So I'm gonna move this out of the way. We'll pop this in the oven and then I'll show you the uh, black lentils. So with black lentils, um, yeah, I, I'm from, you're probably familiar more with red lentils, yellow lentils, green lentils. Um, it makes great lentil soup. You know how to get, they really, some of them, uh, depending on how long you cook them, they just disintegrate. And it's a, still a great protein. Um, I love lentils in soup. But these black lentils, I have found them at either Whole Foods. I know Fresh Market has them. Um, you might be able to find them. I have not seen them at Harris Teeter. Um, you, you may be able to find them at Publix, but um, they are so colorful and they do not cook like the other lentils. And that's one thing that I wanted to um, mention. They don't disintegrate. I mean, I guess if you cooked them long enough, they would. But look at that rich color. They are just beautiful. And they're just as beautiful when you cook them. You'll see uh, the after um, the end product shortly, but the black lentils, they also, they keep their form, they keep their size. They have a wonderful texture when they've been cooked and they don't also don't use up a whole lot of water um, like rice or other lentils do. So what I do is I put two cups of, you know, dried lentils in a pot and then you could use the in, uh, instructions on the, the bag or box, um, but if you're if you're like me and, and you're used to cooking something like this, I'll put the, the lentils in the pot and then I'll just put about two, and I'll fill it with cold water or stock, chicken stock or vegetable stock, and make sure it comes about two to three inches above the lentils. And then I just cook it to a boil um, and let them cook for about 20 minutes. And you just really want, you can set a timer what I do is I taste them and I, I get a, you know, taste the texture often like you would with, with spaghetti. You know how you want to, you know, see see how 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 that texture is. As soon as they're done, um, they'll have a slightly outer shell still, but they'll be creamy inside. Once they're done, um, I just put them in a colander in the sink. I do not save the broth or the liquid because it looks sort of like squid ink. If you've ever seen that, it's like a block, you know, dark gray or black liquid. I don't, I haven't found a use for it, but the lentils cook beautifully. So um, that, those are your lentils. And I'll tell you that I found out about these. Um, well, the client sent me this recipe, but also when you put some um, black lentils together with some uh, roasted or baked salmon and some grilled asparagus, I mean, the colors are just beautiful. And I like to think we eat with our eyes you know, if something looks good, chances are we'll probably eat it. So that's, we've got our lentils and our squash, and now I'm going to just make the dressing. So um, after I get the, I'll tell you a story while I clean this up. So I do, um, I mentioned Our Steak Magazine, and I do the recipe development in each issue, and I also do food styling. And so, um, you know, you might have black lentils or uh, black sesame seeds, and just as a, you know, jokingly, they don't really come across very well <laughs> under the camera, if you know what I mean. They just sort of like, you, know, so you wouldn't want to have these spread out on the, on the, on the table. They wouldn't really, um, you know, come, come, they might look like something else. I'll just leave that to your imagination. So um, you could use a bowl to whisk the, the dressing in. I love using a jar. You probably recognize these jars. This was a, a French brand jelly jar, it's still got some water in it. Um, and I just use these, it's um, really something easy. Um, I could measure, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to, I'm just gonna eyeball it. But you've got the recipe. We're just gonna do um, a, about three teaspoons of rice vinegar. I use rice vinegar just about all the time now. I grew up using, or I, my mom grew up using apple cider um, vinegar, and that certainly got its place. But I love the, um, the mild flavor of rice vinegar, and I, I use it in, in everything. So we're gonna do about three tablespoons. And like I said, I'm just gonna estimate. Um, you can also, um, you know, taste this as you, as you go. Some of y'all are probably familiar with sriracha. You can tell it's one of my favorite 
favorite um, spices because I'm, I'm almost out. You could use um, Texas pink or Tabasco, any hot sauce you want. You could even leave it out. It's not gonna, not gonna take, um, put about a tea, teaspoon in there. Um, it's pretty zippy, but it's got, I like this because it's got a real smoky flavor. And then I also mentioned either um, anchovies or fish sauce. And I know that's like, what? But you don't even know that they're in here. It just adds an umami flavor or, or level of flavor in this dressing. Um, I use, I also use, I use fish sauce a lot, but I am here to tell you, do not use, don't use a lot. I mean, I'm literally just going to a few shakes because it's fermented fish and it is super, super salty. It sounds gross, I know, but trust me on this. The thing that will balance it out is the honey. So we're going to put about two tablespoons. And I sort of just, like I said, that's about one, about two. And this is always fun to, to do. And then we're going to use some um, Dijon mustard. You can just, you can use any brand about two teaspoons. I am gonna, of course, use um, a spoon for this. Um, this is a really, I don't know where I got it, but it's a really good, um, a really good Dijon mustard. Not too strong, it doesn't have a burn like I call it. So we've got um, our rice vinegar, our sriracha, we've got our fish sauce, our honey, and then <clears throat> we've got our uh, Dijon mustard. And then either, I'm gonna do the, um, thyme leaves and the parsley at the end, but there's no oil because the oil was used on the butternut squash and there's, a, there's no oil in this. So, but because the honey um, is so thick, I'm going to shake it up real good. So these little jars, little jelly jars or uh, mason jars will work. Um, but this is a very thin, delicious, healthy dressing. This is good on anything. You could use it as a marinade for chicken. You could use it as a salad dressing, a pasta salad dressing. But the thing I like about it is you pour it on this butternut squash and the lentils while they're warm and it just soaks up the flavor. And it just, I mean, trust me, I don't know if any of y'all are making this at home, but it's, it's really, really good. So I'm getting ready to show you the finished product and then we're gonna take questions. Um, I also wanted to mention the time um, you know, this is super tedious. Somewhere, some, somewhere um, pre-COVID, there was a sous chef that this was their job. They love to take time, time leaves off of the stem. I know that there's a little colander trick out there floating around YouTube, but I have found that, um, you know, it's super easy. If you just, it doesn't take a lot, but I just grab the stem and hold the tip. Actually, the tip can come off. And then I just hold the, hold the top and just very gently pull at the opposite direction. Um, the other thing I'll just add, if you're making soup or where it calls for time, I just throw th this whole, the stem and everything in the soup because as it cooks and as you stir it, the leaves will come off, not all of them, but the, what's needed will come off. And then it's real easy to find when you need to pick it out of the pot. So this is gonna go in the dressing. Also smells so good. And then I'm gonna chop up some parsley that I've washed. This is gonna add a lot of color. And um, I'm just gonna, there's gonna there'll be some, some stems in here. Um, but this will add some, some color to our dish. Now I was telling um, Jasmine earlier, if you wanted to add like, you know, cube up an apple and put cubed apple in this dish, you could do that. Um, you could put green peas in it. But wait till you see this um, end product. It is just gorgeous. So this is what it looks like finished. Isn't that beautiful? And I'm you can see this is not a very wet, side dish so there's no there's no you know dress not swimming and dressing that I know of right there's no dress so it really soaked up you know this much dressing it's it's soaked up all of that I mean you can see a little bit but it's it's just a love it's just a lovely coating and it's just the right amount you've got sweetness you've got the umami 
with the fish sauce or anchovies. You've got a little bite with the Dijon mustard and then the rice vinegar and the sriracha bounce it all out. And then you've got, like I said, a really high volume, super healthy, high fiber, colorful, and easy to make side dish. So there you have it. Black lentil and butternut squash salad with a honey Dijon vinaigrette. Any questions? It looks absolutely fabulous. Oh, good. And Lynn, I love the idea of possibly putting some apples with that because apples mm. and butternut squash go really well. Yes, they do. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want to um, comment or ask a question or anything like that. Lynn, I, I have a question for you. Um, from a chef standpoint, what do you think that pairs especially well with? Great question. I would serve this with either um, a nice delicate fish like grouper or halibut, even flounder. Um, it would also be a really nice um, foundation for some big um, sea scallops. Oh. Um, it would also be good. It's great with chicken. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've mainly served this with, with seafood, but I think chicken would be good. I think pork would be really good, like either, um, you know, pork tenderloin, because you've got the flavors, especially if you added the apple to this, mm. you know, you think pork and you've got Dijon, you know, glaze on the pork. I mean, this would go great with some, with some uh, lean pork as well. Right, or maybe even turkey, some sliced mm -hmm. turkey there. Sure, yeah. Nice. Um, could you add that uh, over a bed of spinach or some other type of a green leafy vegetable? You sure could, yes, absolutely. And that would be a great, almost like, you know, you've got your bed of lettuce or spinach and then you've got this on top. Um, yeah, I had a nice big salad today and uh, sort of did that. And then you could even sprinkle some chopped walnuts or pecans on top um, to give it more flavor um, as well. But yeah, that's a great idea. And then you've got, you know, a nice little side salad. Lynn, it's great to see you in action now where I know you were doing this and the, um, thank you for ha you know being able to show us that I just I, I'm not the cook so this helps me quite a bit. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Thank you. John, you could handle this. Yeah, I could, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really easy and um, butternut squash is one of my favorite soups this time of year and roasting it at 400 and either you know, pre-cut cubes, or like I said, in the big halves, and then just scoop out the, the meat, um, and either, you know, once it's cooled, either blenderize it. There's a ton of great recipes on Google. Um, I also did one, um, you could Google Lynn Wells, or, or actually, you could Google our state butternut squash soup, and there's a butternut squash and apple soup recipe that I did um, recently this, this year. Oh, awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. That sounds delicious. I just want to jump in here and say thank you so much. I have been looking for something to go with whitefish and scallops, and I never, I never, ever, ever thought of squash and lentils. Mm -hmm. So, and um, I tend to overcook both of them. I'm, a, I'm a pretty good cook. I cannot cook these two things, but you've given me so much sort of insight into how to do it, and I'm excited about it. Thank you so oh, much. Goodness. Well, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And the good news is, is they both take about 20 minutes. Um, you know, one's in the oven at 400 and one's on the stove. And in 20 minutes, if you've kind of got your colander ready and your pot holders ready, you can, um, you know, get these out. And I actually, you know, I always test things in the oven. And if they're just about, just about done, I leave them in the oven and turn the oven off. And then, you know, when I'm, after I've drained the lentils, and chop the parsley and made the dressing, then I'll get pan out of the oven. But it's really a, a no stress, delicious side dish. So I'm so glad to, to hear you'll be making it. 
Lynn, I like the idea also that uh, a couple of things about lentils, if you're trying to get more into vegetable or vegetarian based meals, they're, they're a quick cooking legume. Um, so as you said, 20 minutes and you can have them done. Um, but the other thing is that you could make this a pretty quick, like even faster dish by chopping and peeling your squash ahead of time, like the day before. Um, I made butternut squash soup this weekend. I think it was this weekend. And I had chopped, peeled and chopped the day before, put it in glass containers in the refrigerator. Or of course you can buy the pre-chopped and sliced, I mean, uh, peeled. I don't know how long that's been sitting in that container and I prefer to do my own. Right, but, right. Um, but you could yeah. make that dressing the day before, mm -hmm. just shake it up. And I mean, it could be come together pretty quickly in, at the last minute. That's a great point. And to your point about the pre-cut anything, we all know it's much more expensive. I looked at a, a container of pre-cut butternut squash today. It was nine, you know, it said so much a pound, but then you look at the label, it was $9 a pound. Whereas this one squash was $1.69 a pound. Um, you know, so it's just like, okay, I can cut butternut squash. I can peel a butternut squash. Um, and hopefully, you know, by showing you the right tools, just with any job, if you have the right tools, it makes it so much easier to get the job done, whether it's a, you know, electrician or a butternut squash that's in your own kitchen. I have one more question. My husband and I are big fans of spaghetti squash. Mm -hmm. Is this, is this something that we could use uh, potentially with spaghetti squash versus butternut squash? Um, depending on how you cook it, uh, I love spaghetti squash. Um, it, I would almost undercook it though, because if it's overcooked, it, it too will disintegrate. But if you are familiar with cooking it, um, you know, once you, you know, run the fork through it and you have your, your, your threads of, of the squash, I think it would be, be great. It would be wonderful with this dressing. I don't see why you couldn't do it. I would just caution not to overcook the, the squash. Um, and then, you know, if you really want to go all out, you could start, you could put it back in the shell of the spaghetti squash and serve it, you know, from that, like a, you know, you see bread used as chili bowls. Well, this could be, I love using the spaghetti squash. Like sometimes I'll put it back in the, the squash shell after I get all the meat out of it. I'll put it back in there and I'll add a couple of ground turkey meatballs and some marinara and you've got like, you know, you don't even need, a, you almost don't need a bowl or a plate, but um, by all means, give it a try and let us know how it goes. And Lynn, I think uh, that just gave me an idea when you talk about using the shell, um, if you did the same recipe with an acorn squash, mm -hmm. then again, you can use those shells for each beautiful. portion. Yeah, it'd be beautiful. And I, I think, of course, the acorn squash, you're gonna have that prettier color Mm -hmm. and greater flavor than you would like the butternut squash than you would with the um, spaghetti squash. Yeah, very good point. I have a question. So if I were to make this as um, like ahead of time, how long do you feel like it would last? Maybe I'm thinking probably a few days or if I made like the dressing separately, like that was mentioned and I used it for other things, how long do you think that would last too? If you wanting to make it in advance, I would just keep all the ingredients cooked separately, um, store them separately. And then when you're ready, two days, let's say, um, to assemble it, just assemble it, toss the dressing in and you're ready to go. But I would, to keep its freshness, um, I would, wouldn't go any more than a couple, couple of days. And then, eat and then it's you know stays in a contain an airtight container um, or covered in a bowl in the refrigerator um i'd probably go through it in, in three days i'm a little bit more conservative with with things like that just because i think they lose now soup you know gets better but you know spaghetti sauce gets better but things like this um i haven't actually tried it on the fourth or fifth day um but i would say you know just two in general maybe three Okay, that's great. Yeah, I would probably eat it faster than <laughs> that too. So um. you can also cut the recipe in half, you know, and and just make a smaller batch because this feeds eight people. 
And if you want to nibble on it, you know, one day, like make a full batch or half a batch, one day throws an, an apple in it, another day adds some walnuts, another day adds some uh, mandarin oranges, uh, another day adds some dried cranberries. I mean, you could really change it up. It's also really good if you like curry, you could add a little curry to this dressing um, and add that, you know, kind of near the end, just sort of like, oh, this is the same salad, but it tastes completely different. Those are all great ideas. They all sound uniquely delicious. <laughs> well, I, this is what I do. My, my brain works this way. Uh, and I'm always like, oh, this would be good with like that. Or this would be good with that. And sometimes I have to be careful not to say all of that out loud, especially when I'm at somebody's house or um, enjoying a, a meal out somewhere. Very creative. You're the guru. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Well, this is very nice that we get opportunities to have these kind of sessions. So thanks to Cone and thanks for partnering with them in that respect. Um, I'm, I'm honored. It's, it's my honor. I'm happy, happy to be with the team. Hey, Shannon. Hey. Um, Scott wants to know if he gets credit for being my sous chef tonight. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Because he did, he helped peel the butternut squash and he supervises very well. I think you guys might be the ones that are cooking tonight. How is your recipe coming along? We are cooking. Here with the group. Uh, so everything is, is cooking. Everything is cooking, yes. See, I have 13 minutes left on the butternut squash and about 18 minutes left on the lentil. Also have a, a small ham that will finish up at about the same time and some uh, roasted Brussels sprouts. Mm. Yeah, that looks delicious. Sounds oh. great. So then I love the presentation <laughs> also of that. Uh, what beautiful. Bowl you put it it's in. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, I would like to add one um, nutritional comment too. Um, a lot of people are probably aware, or maybe everybody's aware that butternut squash, acorn squash, the winter squashes in general, not spaghetti squash, but these squashes are starchy vegetables, but they don't have as much starch as something like potatoes. So they're a little bit between like the non-starchy vegetables and what we consider real starchy vegetables. Um, and so it's a great way to get some kind of really healthy carbohydrate in your diet. And yet for people who have to kind of watch the carbs and are concerned about um, not spiking blood sugar levels, it's just a really good way to get some carbohydrate that is so satiating and helps to be filling and is so delicious without getting into those carbs that are gonna run your blood sugars up. So, and I, you know, I find um, I grew up in New England in the Midwest and we did a lot. I mean, there was always winter squash in the winter time. And I was surprised when I moved South, um, you know, it was new, newer to a lot of people. So I'm glad to see it in so many grocery stores now. It's, it's more abundant, I think. And Jeannie, when, uh, just as an example of how my mind works, when you said New England, I, met, I immediately thought maple syrup and butternut oh. squash and maple syrup are outstanding. Yeah. Um, if you, you know, you use a, just a little drizzle, it doesn't take much. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's added sugar and calories, but again, if you just really cut back, it just gives it just a hint of flavor, but those two flavors go well together. Well, and you know, it brings up that great point of, let's say you have diabetes. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. you have to wipe all carbohydrate out of your diet. It doesn't mean you have to wipe all fun foods out of your diet. And then the other part, if you're using something like maple syrup, it's not like sprinkling sugar on. Nutritionally speaking, you know, sort of gram per gram, you're getting similar stuff. You're mm -hmm. getting glucose and fructose, but 
it's like so many things. If you're using high quality, very flavorful ingredients, you don't have to use as much. And that maple flavor from real, and of course I'm from Vermont. So I'm going to say, <laughs> no, no, you have to use the real thing. Right. Um, you know, go out and mortgage the house to, if you have to, to, to buy it. But, um, but if you're re really using those high quality ingredients, it, you don't need to use much, you can enjoy it and it's not going to be damaging to your health. Thank you. Thanks for adding that. Good balance. <laughs> all about balance yes absolutely and and you know we've got to remember we are designed to get joy from food right oh yes absolutely actually the nobel prize last week uh peace prize went to the world food program um you know and they, they talked about like the the significance you know with holidays and faith-based sharing and uh, community, that sense of community around it. it just, it was really uh, encouraging to see that actually. I had not heard, thanks so much for sharing that, Sean. Yeah. yeah, it was only like a 50, it was all virtual. So everybody could watch it where usually it's not, um, or maybe afterwards you'd see a tape session, but it was, it's very brief. You can live stream. It's like a 15 minute program where the UN executive director for that program talked about the global situation with things. And so I just encourage people that it was inspiring that they, that was the focus this year. Nice. Well, thank you everyone again for, for joining. I can't think of a better segue to thank you for joining to, to live life well. What, who would have thought those words would mean so much at this time? But it's been my pleasure and a joy to be with you and I hope to see you next month.